The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. You can't buy time, but you can save it. The advisor portal at MLC Life Insurance is just one way we're helping advisors streamline the advice process. Using the advice portal, advisors can generate quick quotes and indicative underwriting decisions in one place. This means less time spent on paperwork and more time focused on clients. To learn more about the MLC Life Insurance Advisor Portal and how it will save you time, visit our website or contact your distribution representative. Hello, welcome back to another episode. I'm James Wrigley and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Sylvia Wade this afternoon that we're recording this one. Normally I record in the morning this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. Thanks for, for joining me. Well, thanks, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, now, Sylvia, you you run a you run a business, or you have a, have a business called Mutual Plans. It's a kind of an outsource contract power planning business. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 And what what's what's the setup that you that you operate under? Like, how many of you? Who? How, how, how does it work? Can you can you talk us through the setup that you've got? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'll start from my personal background, which is more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um. So when I was starting my second master degree, um, I was an investment analyst in AMP on a casual basis. Um, at that time, my task was to create and monitor an indicator for the domestic share market movement oh, wow. <laughs> um, for the investment advisor so he could, uh, you know, kind of uh, monitor his portfolio performance. There was a guy sitting at the corner in the office he was actually an advisor for the superannuation field. Yeah. Um, you know, at that time, the unit didn't uh, teach you simple pension or TTR, so I borrowed the educational uh, materials from him for self-lending. Um, then, yeah, after I finished my two master degrees, which were Master of Applied Finance and a Master of Accounting, I got my first job as an in-house parapilot in the charter practice. For some reason, they positioned me as a self-meant self-fund power partner. Um, so probably you could uh, imagine I started uh, from the sophisticated end. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know at that time. And then after a year, AMP merged with Charter and EXA. Um, I became an AMP centralized uh, power partner. Um, and yeah, I mean, regardless of the mixed uh, public uh, opinions about AMP, I had the best uh, power planning trading with AMP. Yeah, lots of people, lots of people talk really fondly of of, of AMP. I think there's a there's a, there's a difference between the you know, those, those that worked in there like like you uh, and you know you speak highly of your of your time and your experience there versus what maybe is played out in the media and and in other places. There's Two different sides, I guess, to to each story. It's interesting that you say you had a really good time there. Yeah, exactly. The people like myself and uh, the financial advisor in the Horizon program, we all appreciate the training from AMP. Um, that was a variable, you know, for our own personal development and the career later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So um, I stayed in AMP for six years um, until Mutual Power Planning was launched in 2016. Over the last seven years in the business, uh, we have developed into a team of 12 onshore um, para planners um, with a combined of 110 years um, of para planning experience. Um, I'm pretty proud of my team. Uh, we work with 20 plus licensees at the moment, um, including AMP, of course, um, Wells Today, Century, Synquan, um, Centerpoint. Seven Point Alliances, um, IWF Senior, and other independent licenses. Um, another step I'm proud of about the team is that we've completed almost a 7,000 statement of advice um, and the auditing fail rate is zero. So we are pretty 
I'm proud of that to zero record. So you, so you're in Australia and the and the teams overseas. Well, the, all the teams are in Australia. Oh, they're in Australia. They're not overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry, I missed I'm, I missed that part. Yeah. How did you build the teams that that's you know that that's so big? Yeah, twelve people. That's a that's a pretty decent power planning team. How did how did that come up about over time? Yeah. Oh, I guess I started from from myself. Yeah. Um, and then by um, referrals from advisors into their network, um, and the philosophy we hold as you know power planning support. Um, it's yeah, it's varied by the advisors. Um, so I guess we um, whether we get some. Um, you know, a lot of new advisors come into us on the new license days, um, and we are fortunate, you know, to be approved um, power planner providers in the couple of larger license days, uh, which help us, you know, to um, I guess um, talk with more advisors in the network. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and then we are proficient at five uh, financial planning software, including Exaplan, Prudosoft. Middlewinter, Advisor Logic, and Advice Intelligence. That's the whole lot. That's, is it, I don't know. Is there anything else out there? Well, uh, yeah. Well, there are other, you know, plan do for uh, financial planning software like a Dash or Finstreet Six or Five. I mean, um, it's yeah. It's always like one of the questions from an advisor to me is that Sylvia, which software should I use? Because there are too many options there. Yeah. And what do you what do you normally say? How do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I guess. It's probably similar to, you know, the, a device process. So what are your goals? What do you expect from the software? <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I think funny, and it's funny you say that. I think, you know, there, there's a lot of different a lot of different things that come up in in running a financial advice business. You know, we're talking about software selection. It can be staff, it can be development plans and all the rest of it. That that when we're sitting with clients, it's all about, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to do? And then we kind of help you, you know, uh, align the things that you're doing with what you actually want to do, but we somehow forget that process when it's trying to select, you know, the, the financial planning software or trying to help our teams with their development plans. That yeah. well, all of a sudden we forget that process that works so well with clients. Yeah, exactly. Because I always go back to the decision tree. You know, whether you hire a, a power planner for in-house support or you outsource a power planning. Because actually, in the last six months or so. That became one of the most frequent asked questions from advisors. Um, I guess it's a fair question given the tight labor market. You really call me, oh, Sylvia, my power plan is living. Um, you know, I'm exploring the option uh, whether I should hire a replaced power planner or I outsource power planning. Um, again, there's no universal um, answer for that. It's depending on, you know, the practice decision tree. Yep. Yeah. And, and how do you? How do you go about helping someone through that, making that decision? You know, you know, obviously from, from a business perspective, you'd like them to use your own services, but but I'm sure you know there's you, know, you can be more helpful. How, how do you help someone make a decision on whether to rehire an in-house planner, or are they better off just yeah, sorry an in-house power planner, or, or or do they or do they just use an out an, an outsource services like yours? Yeah, sure. So I usually ask them, okay, um, what they expect from the power planners. Some of them say, oh, I want to have a face-to-face -face discussion with a power planner um, and I want to manage you know, him or her personally. So if I go down that path, I think you know, having an in-house power planner might be a better option because uh, you can manage the person you know, directly. Um, but if the decision tree shows, okay, you want a, a lower fixed you know, overhead cost, um, maybe outsourcing power planning um, is an option uh, because um, as far as I know, um, you're going to pay the recruitment cost around 23K um, yeah. to find a suitable power planner. And then on the top of that, you'll pay the annual salary and other obligations. Um, if you engage with an outsourcing power planning, you actually transfer the people risk to you know the, the power planning company. Yep. And so, where is your so your teams in Australia? Are they dotted all around Australia? Like, where where, where does everyone live? Where, where are they all working from? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, I'm based in Sydney. Um, of course, some power planners are in Sydney. Uh, we've got other power planners located in every capital city except the um, Northern Territory. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so we have power planners in Melbourne, Adelaide, and Queensland, and the Perth. Yeah, right. So 
for Percy practice, it's it's an interesting one because uh, although we are in Australia, th- there's a time difference. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you? We are three t- or three hours difference, you know, between the uh, east coast and to the west coast of the yeah. um, city. Um, so the Percy power of Hannah um, works well with the Percy practice because they kind of they're talking the same time zone. Same time zone. I was going to say, do you have to? Do they have to start? You know, earlier or later? Like I'm so. I'm, my associate advisor, I'm in Melbourne, my associate advisor uh, lives in Adelaide and it's, it's only half an hour difference. But um, but yeah, he, he works Melbourne time rather than Adelaide time so that we're, we're both around at the same time. Yeah. That's easy enough to do when it's only half an hour, not so much when it's a three-hour time yeah. difference. Well, we keep that at a different time zone in, in mind. If uh, Queensland, uh, sorry, the power plan uh, works with a purse a advisor, they will have... Um, kind of a, the, the time difference in mind. Um, you know, they get up at nine o'clock, start to work. Oh, it's seven o'clock. You know, in close time, better to hold off the calls or emails until it's nine o'clock in Perth. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the advisor is going to stress that oh, <laughs> happened to you know brush my teeth and I've got the emails from my power planners. <laughs> yeah. No, we're going to get into we're going to get into how you know there's there's been a few. Announcements, QAR, and video SOAs, and, and a lot, a lot of different things going on in the, in the, you know, particularly in the power planners world, and 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 how are they feeling? Which I'm going to get to in a second, but I want to go back to you mentioned you'd done two masters degrees. What what drove you to do two masters degrees? I guess by nature, I like the numbers. Yeah. Um, and I had this uh, the first master degree, sorry, the master of applied finance, uh, down in Macquarie Uni. Um, it was a very uh, intensive one-year program, so we need to do twelve subjects. And then I feel like something's missing in the numbers, which is accounting. <laughs> I kind of have different perspective to the financial planning, you know, the tax and uh, um, the, uh, the analysis. So I sort of uh, feel myself up with the accounting knowledge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I did a, did a two master degrees. Um, and at the, and and what what did you think you would end up doing at the time? And obviously, you know, you've, you've gone down the power planning route and and running a business now. But um, what did you think you would do at the time when you when you had your two masters? I wanted to be a financial planner at that time. Oh, you did, yeah, right. There you go. Um, but uh, I was because um, I had, this is uh, like a you know not to one step or overnight um, you know role. So I started to start from a power planner's role. And then I found, oh, okay, actually, the power planners probably are more suitable for myself. Um, as you know, the financial planners have different skill sets. Yes. Although we are very correlated yeah. um, in the, you know, um, in the advice industry. Um, yeah, so I decided to stay um, on the power planners position. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting you point out that a lot of you know, people on the outside looking in, they say, oh, I want to work in financial advice, I want to be a financial advisor, but it's not until you actually get into the space that you realise there's so many other jobs that are available all in and around the financial advice industry. You don't have to be a financial advisor. You can be a power planner. You can work as an associate advisor. You can go into business operations and team leadership and and, and, and all the rest of it. There's so many different opportunities uh, in, in and around the financial advice industry that's not necessarily just a financial advisor. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, you're going to know what you are good at. Now, we before we press record, we were, we were having a bit of a chat about you know what, what we're going to talk about and, and coming up with, with with some ideas and and, and you kind of raised this idea of how a power plan is feeling at the moment. So you know there's there's been this quality of advice you know re- reforms and so forth um, uh, you know, released a little a little while ago. I'm interested to get you to just kind of cover off on on what does all of that actually mean. What's going on there, and and, and how a, how a power plan is feeling now versus how were they feeling when all of this was w- was going on? Yeah, sure. Well, as you probably know, they're saying there are two certainties in life: death and the taxes. Then the Prudosoft co-founder Vincent Holland added the third one <laughs> recently in his article. Um, he said that. Um, uh, financial advice regulation will change. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah. Parapanists were worried um, during the QAR review and um, before the minister was um, uh, deciding the three streams. Um, Parapanists were 
scared of losing the jobs because of removing the statement of ice. And then after the minister uh, released the stream one, the statement of ice going to change it to fit fit for all purpose um, documents. And paraplaners are worried again. What does that mean? You know, um, does it to take away my daily job? Um, and the second the scarcity is from the artificial intelligence. Like a chat GPT, you can ask, uh, ask a chat GPT to write a strategies. Probably will give you a few strategies in a few minutes. That is, that is a bit of a scary, you know, for power planners. But as far as I'm concerned, um, there's no fear. But he, as a power planners, we have to pre- actively prepare for the changes. You know, financial advice is a personal advice. The based on the client's goals. There's no one size fits all approach. Even if we chat a GPT can write a strategy, it doesn't have that personal, you know, element um, in in that uh, you know kind of a, a beautiful writing. Um, and I think rather than being a robotic a power planner, um, we should be more active and be more like an advanced AI power planner. <laughs> Because traditionally, writing an SOA is all in a power planner's daily job. But in the world, new world, I think we can, you know, work with advisors more closely by utilizing our skills of financial modeling and the knowledge of strategies and the product and help the advisor to formulate the, you know, the advice in hmm. a more thorough way. Yep. Yeah, so I think that that is a value, you know, the power plan is going to shine in the new world. Like a mutual plans, you know, we have um, started the involvement with the um, advisor in their process, including, you know, the advice discussion, the strategy formulation, and the product uh, um, selection. Even if the advisor has decided the strategies, if we see there's a rule to improve in terms of compliance or strategies, we will share our opinion. Um, and yeah, it's a feedback from advisors that yeah, it's very variable for them. Yep. Are, are you seeing any advisors at the moment that are that are using artificial intelligence, chat GPT or, or, or whatever, kind of in conjunction with, you, with, with the power planning services at the moment? Are you, are you seeing any of that going on? Not I'm um, aware of. Um, yeah. I think it, they are cautious about using the chat GPT. I mean, the art uh, Artificial intelligence tools, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so, do, so, do you do you think there's a there's a feeling amongst power planners now that that you know the final results or so forth of, of, of QAR have been handed down? Do you, do you think power planners are still worried about the the, the future of the you know, longevity of their of their careers, or, or what's yeah, the general sense I out think, there? Yeah, I, it still um, has that feeling. I mean, yep. we are glad to hear. Yeah, the SOA is not going to remove, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now it's um, it becomes a call, you know, the minister called the fit for purpose document. Yep. And what's this about? You know, what's included in this new document? So everything is not very certain at the moment. Yep. Um, and again, you know, we're just guessing. Okay, or oh, probably we should, uh, you know, include this or that. But we're waiting for the guidance um, from the minister. So that that I uh, you know, at, at least in at least in our business here that that whatever that document ends up looking like and and hopefully it's it's nothing like a, a regular SOA that we they're all used to at the moment at least in our business the power planning team will still be responsible for preparing that document it's not it's not like me or any of the other advisors uh, we're planning on having them write that document so you know, for any power planners that are listening at least in our business and others that I've spoken to I think they're still still absolutely a, a job there to be done it'll be a different job for sure it'll be a different document that, that you're preparing but as you said there's you know there's an opportunity to, to maybe work a little bit more closely with the advisors in formulating the strategies than than maybe what they what they once were um, in different practices yes because yep. I believe like it doesn't matter what documents we call or what format of the documents is all the pre soa you know process stays. So how we can help with the advisor to formulate the right strategy for the client, how we can show the client will be better off after a device. Um, so that remains and we can add value to that process. Mm. And, and how do you how do you interact with the advisors at the moment? Like how how does someone 
how does someone request an SOA from you? Like, what does that process look like in your business? Yeah, so we have an online portal um, for the advisor to launch um, a power plan request. They can choose the services they like um, and they put the information in. And then from there, they will receive, you know, the ETA pricing and they will get an, an email from us about who their power plan is. So the whole process is very, very transparent. Yep. Not like you send the SOA, then you you wait, <laughs> you wait, and uh, um, and then after a week somebody contacts you. you know? um, so we are very proactive in those uh, process, um, just to make sure you know we are kind of on the top of everything for advisors. Um, and then during the SOA process, you expect um, the power planner will contact you, will introduce a power planner to you and a advisor at the start. So yep. you guys c- uh, make the connection. Um, and then the power planner will work on the case with the advisor. We customize our services. What I mean is we even ask the advisor what your preferred communication method. Is it to buy email or calls or Teams meeting or room video? You know, because the advisor, as you know, the advisor is um, probably age group across, you know, um, from the 20s to 50s or 60s, they all have different uh, preference. True. Trying to accommodate to their personal style. And and so the, the the other bit that we spoke about before was was around this video SOA. So the, you know, there's there's you know, I've, I've spoken on different different podcasts in the last few weeks about you know, different stages that we're at here in in trying to get that up and running and and, and presenting advice and so forth. Uh, the FPA there for a while was running some, some some sessions around the country, getting some advisors along on trying to upskill and, and this idea of, of of doing a video SOA. Have you had any exposure to it? Do you, do you, do you feel that there's you know may, maybe power planners are feeling a little bit threatened by that or, or, or worried by that? And what does that mean for their job as well? Yeah, well, it is a, a change for us. Um, well, the concept of the video SOA came from if we chop away. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's I guess it's a bond in the time when people felt paper statement advice wasn't efficient anymore, um, and I I feel a, quite a few advisors our clients are visual in this. Yep. Um, I personally attended the video SOA first uh, workshop. Um, oh, you did? Yeah, late last year. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that room we had um, five. Round the tables of people from different backgrounds, you know, from the auditing, compliance, the financial planners, and the power planning. Um, so yeah, we had a very good session. Um, it was an innovative idea, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so like 80 pages of statement advice can be concisely demonstrated by a few slides and by a real time, you know, presentation meeting with the clients. Um, that is a, a very dramatic change in the power planning, I guess, you know, the work style. Yeah, but uh, but I, I, I can see, you know, um, advisors are very interested um, in trying um, that format because afterwards, you know, I'm, I'm in the WhatsApp group. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I can see the WhatsApp group is very active, you know, with advisor inquiries. Oh, what equipment I should buy? What device? What brand? <laughs> and then the um, the the first uh, the feedback about to the first um, video SOA trial. So I can see people, advisors are like a trying it, um, and yeah, and the, most the um, feedback is very positive. Yep. Have Have you given any thought as to how you might implement? Video SOA services in your business has has that has that been on your radar just yet? Yeah, that you are. It's definitely on my to do list. Yeah. <laughs> um, in my advisor um network um so far, um, none of them has started the video S- SOA, um, but we've switched to the strategy paper to strategy slides. Um, so sometimes the advisor requires strategy paper with different uh, you know scenarios of analysis, and we do the modeling and we show the outcome, and we we have a discussion with the clients. Uh, sorry, the advisors. And now, rather than writing down the strategy on the piece of paper, we created a visual charts and the comparison tables. Yep. So that helps the advisor to you know um, take those slides into the client meeting. 
um, and they can demonstrate how the um, recommendation came out from other scenarios considerations, um, as well as how the client uh, will be better off after the device. Yet. Um, yeah, I did not receive the positive feedback from there because they, they felt the clients were more engaged. Good on you because I, I, I really feel that's a, that's a real opportunity for, for power planners and, and you know, power planning businesses like yours that to, to, to kind of build that into, the, into it. You know, you're, it sounds like you're, you know, you're, you're working with a lot of big licensees as, as part of their, you know, their, their kind of network of, of power planning uh, services and, and I suspect those big licensees are probably going to be reasonably slow to move in, in, this, in this type of fashion. I'm, I'm part of that WhatsApp group as well and, <laughs> and, and, and I, think, I think it's some of the people that have been responding in there, not that I really know them, but I, but I get the sense that they're probably in smaller businesses, you know, it's, it's, it's one or two people at most and, and, they're, and they're doing it like one of the guys that was in the, in the group that I attended, it was, uh, it was just him, him on his own. I don't even think he had a, an admin person. I think it was just him on his own and, and he maybe using the power planning outsource services and he was starting to do it himself. I think the bigger businesses are going to be slower to move, but, but absolutely there's an opportunity there for, for you and other businesses like yours to, to be able to offer that for those that when, when they do start asking that, yeah, we've, you know, we've got this down pat and this is, and this is what what we're doing and how and how it can work in the, in in the other financial planning businesses. Yeah, because I come back to the point of you know power planners scarcity. Um, video SOA is not going to take away power planners regular job. Instead, we just you know we will be more creative. <laughs> we just convert all the analysis into you know the the beautiful or more visualized the charts and the tables. So that certainly you know, kind of increase our value in the, in the, yeah. In the process. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And and then I reckon for the right, <clears throat> for the right power planner, that's, you know, it, they're, you know, possibly doing something that's, that's maybe even more interesting to them than, than what they may be doing all, already now. Uh, yeah. Providing that service. And, and so, the, yeah, it's, it's still, we're, we're, we're doing some video SOAs here and we've got a bit of a launch later in, later in the week. And um, certainly, the power planning team is absolutely front and center with that. The, the document that's coming out of the power planning team is a whole lot less pages, but hey, there's still a whole lot of work that's going into it, and uh, it, it's really just the advisor presenting it in a different fashion to what they what they maybe were before. Yes, yeah. Yep. Not, um, I mean, as you know, as a human beings, um, everybody learns things differently. For the visual learners, you can present, you know, the video as the way, but for the um, for the clients who are like an engineer, you know, lawyers, and they prefer to read every single number in the table. Well, that's what I was told by yeah. financial planners. Maybe the paper state went to device, you know, um, still suits them. Yeah, read it from cover to cover and then come back in a few days later and uh, and ask the questions after they've read it from cover to cover. So what? So what's next for you and 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 the business and I guess in, in power planning more more generally? What what do you think's next for you? Um, I guess you know we will kind of um keep an updated uh, with all of the industry changes, um and um every power planner in my team goes to a PD day. I mean the professional development day once a year to you know get um the feeling what the industry and um, is happening. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I guess we will um, invest ourselves more in terms of um, the strategies formulation as well as the compliance, because I believe the compliance is unavoidable. Um, you know, in the whole advice process, yeah. and we can be the compliance gatekeeper too. Um, you know, when we prepare a statement of advice, if we see oh, there's question of the sole purpose test, maybe we should have stopped. You know, ask the advisor, here's those purpose tests. Do you have a file note? Do you justify if we're all fees are charged from the product? So, while well, you provide the personal device, or where we prepare the statement of advice, and uh, it seems uh, there's conflict in the scope of advice, um, we can pick up the call and, you know, have a discussion with the uh, advisor. So, I guess in future, we will be more involved um, in the advisor's um, advisor process. Absolutely, um, Sylvia. Th- thanks for, for for joining me today. For for anyone that wants to reach out to you and find you, maybe talk a little bit more about your services and, and, and what you offer. Where can people find you? 
oh, well, please jump on our website, mutualplans.com.au. Yeah, we'll um, we'll put some links to your website and and and, and maybe you're on LinkedIn or something like that. We'll put some links to where people can find you and find your website, learn a little bit more about you, and if and if they want to get in touch to uh to to get some help. So, Sylvia, thank you, thank you a lot for joining me. Hopefully, the podcast today maybe might reassure some paraplaners that 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 listen into it that there's absolutely still a need uh, for for you in the industry and your and your help and your services might look a little bit different to what you're used to at the moment but uh, I don't think the job of a paraplane is going anywhere anytime soon yes thanks for having me here Jane thanks Sylvia